Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 499 of the podcast and it is Friday 24th of July 2020 as I record this. We are so close to 500. (laughs) So today I'm talking to Nick Thacker about writing action adventure thrillers and the issue of falling between genres as well as his 100 year plan which is a little extreme, how his indie publishing business works, why he prices his ebook so high, building an email list, and much more. So that is coming up in the interview. In publishing news, the hot sheet reports on the All About Audio conference, including audio revenue, is expected to overtake ebook sales by 2023. You know, part of me has that, that part of my brain that goes, 2023, that's a really long time away. And then you realise that 2021 is not that far off. And it's kind of that weird scenario. So that's really interesting. Subscription services are growing at a faster rate outside the US in Europe and emerging markets. And I think As I've said before, subscription services are just inevitable and they are part of the way people consume now. And I don't have a problem with subscription services. I have a problem with exclusivity, which is obviously only one company (laughs) requires that right now. But it's interesting that this report says each country or market is unique in its pattern of consumption. And in every country, local content and language predominate. And as I said before, and I'm going to come, I'm actually going to do a futurist segment today. You can look forward to that in a minute. But basically, I do think this local content and localization of language is going to accelerate with the growth of AI translation and narration because, you know, more content can be localized faster. And we've got a problem right now in many places in the world. I mean, there's a huge ecosystem of English language narrators, producers, audio is, it has been, is a mature market in the English language, but in many languages, it's barely even started yet. And I heard this at the podcast movement conference. They were like, yeah, there's just not much, there's not enough local language content for a lot of people people. So we might have, as I did with German last year, sort of first draft with AI and then local text and audio editors. But certainly it's going to speed things up and bring the cost down. So that localization need is what's driving it. It's also worth noting, it says it was also noted that audio is its own industry rather than an offshoot of book publishing, especially if you include podcasting. And a quote from the conference, we see more and more stories being born originally in audio and stories that are written to become audio first. And maybe later on, they become a print book. Now, this is fascinating to me because I definitely feel this. I feel that audio is really a very different medium to the written word, uh, say an ebook or a print book. And why audio rights are so bundled up is because of the historical publishing process. But, you know, I think we are going to see more and more of this. I certainly want to write for audio it's something that I definitely want to be doing. And it's on my list of my really long list. (laughs) I'm sure you have your long list too. But I would love to write something that was designed to be an audio drama. And it will happen or maybe a podcast audio or something. But I think this is the first time I've seen it written that they really think it is audio is its own industry. This is also underscored by the bookseller reports this week on the launch of Storyglass, which Penguin Random House and DK, I think that's Dorling Kingsley or something like that, PRH and DK, they just assume you know what that is, with other pod publishers are starting a podcast business called Storyglass. So Storyglass will operate as a standalone company and will focus on developing and producing podcasts of all genres, complementing the output of businesses across TV, media, books and music. So these are publishers coming together to create a podcast business Plus, The Verge this week reports that the New York Times is acquiring the podcast studio that created Breakout Podcasts, Serial and S-Town, a signal that the podcast market is becoming ever more competitive and experiencing consolidation as a result. 
Now, I talked uh, last week about Spotify, or a couple of weeks ago, Spotify taking on Joe Rogan, but then also Michelle Obama and a whole load of other people. And what I think this underscores is that, and I've said before, the days of blog tours for books are possibly over and that more and more people are now focusing on podcasts and podcast interviews and podcast marketing and obviously underscored by traditional publishing now. And it's kind of hilarious that I'm coming into episode 500 after 11 years of podcasting that now publishers have recognised this is valuable. <laughs> but maybe I am super early on these things. But hey, being super early is, is allowed. <laughs> <laughs> just means that the first few years nobody believes you. Uh, okay, what else? Oh yes, Amazon Ads has reported, Amazon Ads reporting now incorporates page reads. And for those of you who are in KU, and I do have the Penny Appleton books in KU because I just don't do any other marketing on those books. They're my mum's sweet romance that I publish for her. And Amazon Ads Reporting now incorporates page reads. To help our authors better measure the impact that ads are having, we've added the Kindle edition normalized pages read read to your performance dashboard. So this is really great news for those of you who are using Amazon ads because the reporting has been, well, still is pretty bad to be honest, but at least now there will be some inclusion. So I haven't actually looked at the dashboard. It says no action is required from you with data reported as of 15th of July. So yeah, I need to go have a look at that for Penny, but yeah, good news. So the futurist segment. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm quite excited about this. The pandemic has been in the news so much that it, it's been hard to keep track of anything else. I'm sure you also feel the same. It's like I lost my radar of a lot of other stuff because I was so, like us all, obsessed with the way the pandemic was going in the first few months. And now I feel like we can maybe just go, yep, pandemic is happening. And we just carry on living our lives in a slightly different way, but we can actually pay attention to other things. <laughs> so this week, I spoke virtually at Western Colorado University to Kevin J. Anderson's publishing master's program on futurist topics. And so I revisited a lot of things, which was great. The timing is really great on this because it's been a very big few weeks in AI. So you might remember that last year I talked about GPT-2 which was originally not released by its creator, OpenAI, because its natural language generation was considered dangerous. So like it can generate all this text and it could be deep fake and blah, blah, blah. But of course, it was released <laughs> in batches and they released certain levels of it over time. But now GPT-3 is available for commercial use. And this is actually, actually is a bit like 4G to 5G in terms of mobile. It's not just one to the next. It's sort of a hundred times bigger. And GPT-3 is available for commercial use, basically AI software as a service that can generate text, code and other things I'll talk about in a minute. But basically, I am serious about the hundred times. So basically, GPT-2 had 1.6 billion parameters. GPT-3 has 175 billion. So I'll tell you a bit more about it. GPT-3 was built by directing machine learning algorithms to study the statistical patterns in almost most a trillion words collected from the web and digitized books. It uses its digest of that immense corpus to respond to a text prompt by generating new text with similar statistical patterns. I'm going to link to the articles in the notes, but I'm quoting from towardsdatascience.com and wired.com. And I'll come to another one in a minute, but I'll link to these articles in the notes. Or if you just search GPT-3 at the moment, you're going to find a ton of really interesting stuff. But just to remind you about machine learning, because someone asked me this question when I was speaking about it at the university thing. Machine learning is not about programmers telling a machine what to do. So my husband's a programmer and I used to do a bit of programming back in the day. When you are a programmer, you're like, OK, I want the computer to do this. I type these code and then it will do the thing I tell it to. Whereas machine learning is, here's a big load of data, data set, and it will figure out a task on its own. So, for example, here's a load of data, write a romance novel or write a romance story or whatever. Here's a prompt, tell me something. And I've talked about this a lot. If you are new to the show or you haven't really engaged with this before, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash future, where you'll find links to previous episodes where I've talked about things with Marcus de Sotoy, who's a professor at Oxford University and wrote a book called AI and Creativity. Also, my solo show on AI from last year. It's clearly time I did another one because things are just moving on so fast. But yes, towards data science, the article's really interesting. It's also got a poem 
generated by GPT-3, which is quite beautiful, and a discussion on dragons and imagination. I think it's really, I mean, the article itself is quite technical, but the words that GPT-3 is generating is fascinating. Unfortunately, it's not available for us to, to try out because it's so expensive. The processing power is expensive, but I'll come back to this in a minute. So GPT-3 can do many different tasks with no additional training. And this is the big change. No fine tuning. It was trained as a language model. And unsurprisingly, it's an excellent language model. Given a news article title and first sentence, it can generate full articles by predicting the next word that is likely to appear. The resulting news articles are so good that humans can't tell if they are real or machine generated. And look, to be honest, AI in journalism has been developing pretty fast. Companies like Bloomberg use a lot of generated news. GPT-3 can do many other tasks, some of them quite well. It can translate between languages, perform reading comprehension tasks at a decent level, answer SAT style exam questions with some accuracy and answer trivia questions. Amazingly, GPT-3 can even do things that its creators did not think of, like generate code. This is fascinating to me as well, because code generation, I think, is very similar to generate what we do as writers. Uh, I absolutely believe that coding is creative, because you're trying to achieve, you're trying to do something in the world, and you use language, it's just a different language to what we're used to. My husband writes programs in different languages, like four or five different languages, and that is creative. And so the fact that GPT-3 can generate code is causing a lot of interest in the community, as well as the text. Also, they note in the Wired article, GPT-3 often spews contradictions or nonsense <laughs> because its statistical word string is not guided by any intent or a coherent understanding of reality. But it is also noted that some speeches and tweets by particular politicians don't necessarily always sound coherent. <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. And of course, humans are not necessarily coherent all the time. And I think that some of the criticisms of this stuff is, oh, well, it's not exactly perfect. Well, you know, are we perfect? And we're not talking about, oh, anyway, I'll come to the implications in a minute. I just want to carry on. I hope I'm, anyone who's scared has probably left by now. But I'm pretty excited by this. As ever, there are problems with bias based on the training data. Humans have their issues. And as I have talked about before, we need training data that incorporates diverse voices. If you are training a model on books that are out of copyright, which is basically what a lot of them are, it will be mostly dead, white, English-speaking, wealthy men from the UK and the US, probably, in general, or you know, the same or dead, white, wealthy men of other countries, because those are the people who 70 years ago were generally the ones who were getting published. So what we urgently, I think we urgently need copyright law for AI that makes it possible to train large data sets on modern work and pays the creators some kind of micropayment or something that rewards us for helping train data models. Otherwise, it's just going to happen anyway without our permission. So I think this GPT-3 makes it even more urgent because this is just GPT-3. One year after GPT-2 and it's 100 times the size in terms of the model. So what happens when we get to GPT-5 or 10? So even if you're sceptical about this possibility, I would really urge you to have a look at some of these stories. And also, some people say that AI development and these larger training models will be curtailed by the amount of electricity needed to power them. They are energy hungry. They seriously devour energy. But there have been new developments in using light instead of electricity to perform computation, which significantly improves the speed and efficiency of machine learning. So that barrier to growth may well be changed by the way that we do these terms of computation. And this, this type of, I think they call it photonics, is way beyond my understanding. <laughs> but again, I'll link to start, I'll link to an article in The Independent in the UK about that. But this light computation, I did some research on it, and it's been around for a number of years now. It's, this is not new. It's just when people are hitting this computational ceiling and computational cost. So we need to switch the way things are done. Right. So the implications for us here, if entire books, well, articles can already be generated. You know, such is life. If you're a article writer, I would certainly be looking for other ways to make an income. 
If entire books can be generated from existing licensed work, think about the implications of that in terms of the tsunami of content. Add on the increasing advancement in AI translation and there will be more and more choice available for readers. So what does this mean for us? So personally, I am not worried. I hope you can tell. I am excited and I see AI as a tool. So like the internet, without the internet, I would not be speaking to you. I would not be making a living selling my books online. I would not be able to do to have the life I have now. I would also not be able to watch some of the cool things on Netflix and do all the wonderful things the internet gives us. So seriously, the internet is incredible, but also it is a cesspool of humanity, depending on where you hang out. It is both incredible and terrible. And that is inevitable. And in fact, I recommend that you read a book called The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly and also Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari, which talks about this kind of the human condition of being on the edge of good and bad and how generally we're still tending towards the good, even though sometimes uh, things look bad. But I fully see AI as something like the internet. It is an enabler for both good and bad. And we want to be on the side of the good also, obviously. So for example, I fully expect to use an AI assistant of some kind to help me write in the future. Like I already use pro writing aid to improve my sentence structure and grammar. I'd be very interested in having a model like GPT-3. I mean, I would even love to use that software as a service. I probably have a look at whether I can actually do that. (laughs) But I would love to feed it my existing fiction and a few ideas and see what it came up with. A bit like a writing prompt. And I want to use it as a creative partner, a bit like the Centaur chess model, which emerged once Deep Blue beat Carrie Kasparov. The human plus computer model became a specific way of competing. So it was like, if you're just a human or you're just a computer, that's one thing. But if you're human plus computer, this is the possibility. So I think this will expand our human creation. I think this is why engaging with this is so interesting. Like go and read the poem, but remember you have to give it a prompt. This is a dumb tool with an incredible, it's difficult to find words to use, but if you think of it like some kind of artificial mind that you can use as a partner to create, this is fantastic. So I think it will also mean a bigger role for curation. How do you find the good stuff in a sea of content? And Go to journalismai.com, which is an interesting site about how AI is impacting journalism. And it has at the top, items worth your attention about AI and journalism, human curated and summarized. And that phrase human curated, that I think is where we will sit as makers who embrace tools. And of course, you guys, you're listening to this on a phone or a smart speaker or in a car. And we all use tools in our daily lives. This is just a new tool. So the idea of human curation, I think, is similar to this idea of the way we will use these technologies is we will create things, but we will then curate. So if if I use an AI partner to write using my own work to train it, I will then curate. I'll be like, mm, yeah, that's not a good idea. I don't want to use that. Or what if I went this way, that way, the other way? So I will be directing. It's almost human direction, human curation. In the same way that I think with AI narration, which I've discussed obviously with audiobooks, I think there will be different levels of products. So, for example, you can get very cheap AI narrated version, which might be like an ebook, and then there'll be the artisan human narration, which will be more expensive, which might be a premium edition, like a hardback book would be. And I've been thinking this Brandon Sanderson Kickstarter, which is fascinating, that I've been talking about the last few weeks. I'm very interested in doing this. I remember about a decade ago, Cory Doctorow did some hardback limited editions where he actually used ephemera from his own diaries in the books, which made them truly limited edition. And I've got like 50 diaries that I've been writing, journals that I've been writing for years. I could use snippets of those in hardback books to make them truly limited edition. And AI cannot produce that. That physical product is completely unique. So I think this is very exciting. Well, it's an exciting time to be an author who embraces change. It is a scary time if you do not want to embrace this change. And obviously, it's not like tomorrow. But I hope you can see that GPT-3 is a step in that direction, a step that is faster than many people thought would happen. So my intent is to surf the wave, not drown in it. I like using this metaphor. 
So also doubling down on being human. I'm going to have some of my catchphrases. (laughs) Double down on being human and the flaws that make you human. Build your audience as a real person. Be authentic. Share who you really are. Don't try to compete with the bots. You can never be that fast. Think about when these books can at the press of a button. I mean, if you've tried the DeepL, D-E-E-P-L dot com for the translation, you'll know that you upload a book and you press a button and it takes less than two seconds to translate a whole book into another language. So if you think that this is the type of speed at which things are happening, then you have to think we cannot keep up with speed. So don't do that. Focus on being unique, being human, being you. Write what you love and build that audience of a thousand true fans, as Kevin Kelly has talked about. The mass market is over and we are truly living in the long tail. And that's fine with me. And I will be talking about this more next week in episode 500 in terms of what has changed in book marketing, what my marketing looks like now, and how a thousand true fans has to be the bedrock and how we go forward as creators in this potentially very different world. So I hope you found that interesting. That is the futurist segment. I know I don't do it every week, but I wanted to give you that update. And then just a quick personal update, because I am basically still in admin hell with updating my covers and metadata. But when you're, as I said last week, when you're wide and you have to go through all these different formats, I've got large prints, paperback, hardback, eBooks on all the stores, And I'm redoing the covers and the series title for Desecration, Delirium and Deviance. Now the Brooke and Daniel series after my main characters, Jamie Brooke and Blake Daniel. And I will get there, but it's interesting trying to unpick many years worth links and metadata and all of this. But I'll get there. And once I have another clear trilogy with the covers were great before, but these are much more genre specific. I will turn my various ad funnels on and I'll be talking about that a bit more next week. I've also spent a lot of time this week on episode 500. I'm having to obviously do a lot of work in advance for that because I want it to be really good. I think you're going to enjoy it. Also, Map of the Impossible launched. Yes, I did have a book launch. But as ever, when you have book three in a trilogy, it's not so much about marketing that trilogy as so much as just letting your tribe know it exists. But it's always good to have a book out in the world. And again, that's another trilogy that I can kind of turn the ads on with. So yeah, getting reviews on it, letting my tribe know it exists. I've also found a narrator for Map of Shadows. So hopefully she will do the whole series, a British narrator. And so the audiobooks will hopefully be in hand soon. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Nagendra Yadav on YouTube said, this episode is a gem as far as I am concerned. I enjoy reading Lindsay's books and it's great to know her writing process. Angela says baking while listening to the podcast. And Andy Rose said, loved the interview. Can't wait for episode 500. Uh, Fantastic. Oh, I wanted to say hi to Mr. Capone on Twitter, who said, discovered your podcast this weekend. Appreciated the four episodes I listened on my car ride home from my writer's retreat. And I also wanted to say thank you to all of you who spread the word about the podcast and who tell your friends. Clearly, somebody told Mr. Capone about the podcast and he listened on the way back from the writer's retreat. So thank you very much. Also, thanks to Alistair McGuinness in Australia, who sent a picture of audio for authors overlooking the sea. When I went to Australia for the first time, I flew into Perth and travelled up the west coast there. It was lovely to see that area of Australia. And Alistair said, feeling motivated at receiving birthday gift. So excited. Oh, yes. Wanted to say thanks to Denise in California, who said listening while walking and even doing exercise. I put the exercise video on silent, watch the moves and listen to the podcast simultaneously. Also, she said, your note about Ingram providing free ISBNs encouraged me to make the decision to go wide with my single nonfiction book. And your mention on the blog that reads you had an editor program was exactly the info I needed. Fantastic. Really glad to help you there, Denise. And in fact, very good timing on that comment because today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark. And fantastic news for Ingram off the back of the pandemic. They are one of the companies that are doing well because 
All these publishers are discovering print on demand and Ingram are investing in more infrastructure, which is good for us. A little bit of a painful transition as they get a massive amount of work, but things are going incredibly well for them and it will mean even more opportunities for going wide with print, which I'm pretty excited about. So I'm spending a lot of time on Ingram Spark at the moment as I redo Desecration, Delirium and Deviance. One of the brilliant things you can do at Ingram Spark you can't do anywhere else is create print on demand hardbacks. So we can now have those editions as well as paperback and large print. But why use Ingram Spark when you can use KDP Print? Well, the biggest reason is because Amazon is not the only place that people buy print books. Shock horror. Bookstores, libraries, universities, schools all buy from catalogues and expect a discount as well as bulk deals. And Ingram Spark puts you in those catalogues making your book available in 40,000 outlets worldwide. Basically, if you're only on KDP Print, you're missing out on wide print distribution. Now, I publish on KDP Print for Amazon and then Ingram Spark for everything else. So essentially, my print sales have continued to expand with my books appearing in bookstores, literary festivals and libraries and various countries all over the world, which is very exciting. So Ingram Spark have a really useful blog and a podcast, for example, articles on how to self-publish a photo book or a hardback book or any of the other normal things like paperbacks and You can do cool things like personalise a print run. So, for example, if you sell in bulk to a school or a book group, you can personalise, you know, add a page at the front, dedication or something. You can even use their free ISBNs, as uh, helpful Denise pointed out there. They have a friendly help team and they have free online courses. They basically are a brilliant company and I only have sponsors on the show who I use myself and love and Ingram Spark is a key part of my business as an independent author. So it's your content. Do more with it with Ingram Spark. Just go over to ingramspark.com to check it out. Right, this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon and also to those people who've increased their pledge at this time. I really appreciate it. Thanks to new patrons, Sarah Lauzon or Lauzon, Travis Senzaki. Thanks so much to everyone who's supporting the show. And for just a couple of dollars a month, you can get the backlist Q&A audio plus I will answer your questions every month. And you will also get 10% off my courses. You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Nick Thacker is the USA Today bestselling author of action adventure thrillers. His non-fiction books for authors include Platform Mastery and Book Bob Mastery. Welcome, Nick. Welcome. Well, I guess, thank you. I should probably <laughs> say it's dead. It's good to be here. It's good to be talking to you again. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you on the show. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. I was late to get to writing. I grew up reading a lot and never really liked writing. And so when I finally decided to write a book. It was 2012 or 2013. I don't know. Anyway, long story short, I wrote a book because my grandfather passed away and I wanted to give a gift to my dad that Christmas, a book that I'd written. And so I, like most of us, I thought, well, how hard can this be? This seems pretty simple. Just write a book and publish it and we're good to go. And of course, I was super naive and very wrong about how easy it was, but it was a fun process. I really enjoyed it. And in writing that first book, I had other ideas for books. And so I continued doing it until I realized that the indie publishing community and people like you that I was starting to latch onto and read about had figured out a way to actually make some money in this whole thing. So I did some of that stuff and tried to make my way at it. And gosh, lo and behold, here we are 20 something books later, and it seems to be working out okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, you're being very humble there. It's worked out very well. I believe you have left your job, haven't you? You are a full-time writer now. I am a full-time writer. I'm sitting in my basement bunker right now staring at my computer screen where I do all my writing. <laughs> and we'll come back to your some of your publishing stuff in a bit. But first of all, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, you recently ran an, a great online summit for action adventure writers, and I was on a couple of panels. And it was really fun. You, you really did a great job in this time of craziness. And you sat across the whole thing, which was a long session. <laughs> so I wondered, you write action adventure thrillers, obviously, and you listen to a whole load of people. So what were the key aspects that kept coming up over and over again and that kind of function as top tips? Yeah, well, thanks for saying that about the the summit. I can only take a little bit of the credit for doing some of the tech stuff, but that was all Dave Wood, a friend of mine, a friend of yours. That was his idea to do this, but it went really well. 
it was just really cool to sit in and talk to people whose books I've read over the years and not connected with, or people like you whose books I've read, and I've never talked about the craft of adventure writing before, at least not in a co large combined session like that. A lot of people these days are talking about marketing, which is obviously important, but that was one of the key things Dave wanted to do was, what is it about action writing that makes it adventure writing or action adventure writing? It seems like what I was picking up on most was that people go to these types of books and movies for the ability to not quite go to a completely fantastical world. This isn't fantasy adventure, but to go into a different place of the world that they know, I guess. We got into a long discussion in one of the sessions that I was on about how to write different settings that you may not have been to before. And I was on a panel with Joe Nassis. And he and I went back and forth about how accurate we need to be with details and things like that. And it just seems like a lot of readers are going to our work, books like this, because they want to escape to another place that they may not have been or somewhere that they've been but have not discovered, I guess, enough. But in a nutshell, that was probably the biggest thing I picked up on. I agree with you. And I was thinking about it then from a reader perspective. I mean, the reason I write the books I do, and I presume you do too, is because these are the books we like to read. And when I was an IT consultant and miserable in my job, like every lunchtime I would go to the bookstore and I would buy another thriller. James Rollins, who obviously, and people whose writing, as you say, is it's set in our world, but it is an adventure, an action adventure version of our world. And I love the Lara Croft movies and the sort of Mr. Right. and Mrs. Smith and sort of kick-ass female protagonists. And James Bond. So th these are the types of things that are thrilling, are thrillers, but also have that adventure aspect that I think takes people out of their day to day life. So as you say, it's taking you to another place in inverted commas, but it's not space or anything like that. It really is set on Earth. So do you get that sense from your readers that setting and place and adventure is why they're coming to you? I do. I've got a few beta team readers, beta readers on my street team is what I call it who actually will do some of the research for me. And of course, it's unprovoked. I'm not asking them to do free work, but they love doing that research. They love sending me, hey, you know, you wrote this. It's set in Switzerland. I've been to Grindelwald. It's a really beautiful town. Maybe put the shop on this side of the street instead of this because I've been there. I love that kind of stuff because that saves me the time of having to research something else. But it's those little details that I think really capture the realism of a, a setting. that we're, we're writing fiction, obviously, but since it is set in a world that people know, it's important to get that stuff right. Another reader who has been to all of the places in Alaska where I set my main character's cabin. And so I described that area a lot. Of course, I've never been there. So I tried to choose a place that was sort of off the beaten path so it wouldn't have been highly visited so people can call me out on things that are wrong about it. But he's come through more than once. Hey, you've got a car scene, a car chase scene in this book on this highway. The cliffs are actually on the other side. So if he's going south, it would be on the left. Or... So things like that are just really helpful for me. But just to kind of rewind and answer your question, from my perspective as an author, when I started writing this stuff and really nailed down my brand, what I wanted to do, I have what I call a formula. And I'm putting finger quotes because I know formula and is a bad word to a lot of writers. But my formula, if you will, is essentially taking some prototypical technology and giving it to a really bad person or organization and then dropping the whole thing or their layer, if you, you know, whatever it's called, into an exotic location and the good guys have to go find the bad guys. I mean, all of my books are essentially that. And I try to put in the history, some of the cyber tech thriller type stuff, the elements of those books that I know, like Dan Brown's and Clive Cussler's, as you've mentioned, James Rowland's. And so it's that combination of it all. But the setting is really key. I try to put the book somewhere that I've never been or that I would want to go that I think my readers would also enjoy experiencing. Oh, and that's the difference between us. I tend to go and visit and research. I and mean, that's part of what I love about my job <laughs> is actually oh, absolutely. doing well, the research. So. I love the research by visiting. That's definitely on the docket for my future plans. I would love to be able to afford to do that with all of my settings. But when you put things in like Antarctica. And the oh, yeah, I haven't been there, to be before, fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little trickier to get there. But yeah, of course, it's not hard to go to Switzerland. It's not hard to go. I put one in Philadelphia, obviously. These are places that are certainly within reach. Yeah, and it's uh, interesting. So you use the technology angle and I use the historical slash religious object as a MacGuffin. And there was a discussion on the MacGuffin, wasn't there? And the thing the goodies and the baddies are trying to get and destroy and all of this type of thing. So yeah, I love that. And I wanted to ask you, so action adventure often feels like an older genre, like a lot of old white guys, you know, Clive Cussler, bless him, now dead, obviously. <laughs> but Wilbur Smith, you know, movies like Indiana Jones, there was a whole panel on Indiana Jones, which is what, I want to say 35 years <laughs> old. <laughs> At least, right? right. <laughs> Something like that for maybe for, like still in our lifetime, but really old. 
But I just saw that National Treasure 3 is in the works and I feel like National Treasure is another brand that sort of brings back action adventure. And there's yeah. lots of newer, younger writers now in the genre, certainly on within KU as well. So do you think there is a change? Do you think there's a renaissance in action adventure? Gosh, I hope so. So this is actually a question I was going to ask you if we were on a panel together, because I think you're a very modern master of this exact genre that we're talking about. I hope to be that for some readers, but I think the problem really isn't that it's old. I think it's just not well-defined by the stores or the booksellers or any, anyone who's putting this stuff in front of readers. I think it's just not well-defined enough. If you go to the book bubs or different book sites that are giving away or selling or discounting books, they've got categories for action and adventure. Amazon's the same way. They've got categories for action and adventure, but they're not quite this exactly. You know what I mean? Like our books are certainly in those categories. But then if you look up action adventure, you'll come across Harry Potter, which is, I guess, can be described as action adventure, but it's not quite what we're talking about, right? And so there's this sort of disconnect, I think, between what we're talking about, this archaeological, historical based action adventure thriller that all doesn't fit into a, a name and into a title. So they have to just call it action adventure. And then we get lumped in with all these other books that like Star Wars or something else that may be action adventure y, but not really exactly that. So, yeah, I think there's definitely, I hope, a renaissance coming of people finding that they love this sort of stuff. But I think the big problem right now is it's just hard to find. It's too hard to find. It's not impossible. But I know I love reading Dan Brown's books. Those are just about always categories categorized in thriller or even mystery. There's not really an action adventure genre that I can go search. I think there's just a missing category here that we're, we're all writing books in. Yeah, and it's so funny because over the last decade or something since I've been putting mine out, uh, my Arcane series, it really is so difficult because on the one hand, sometimes I think, oh, they have aspects. Mine kind of have aspects of what you might call supernatural, but it's not supernatural in the same way that the sort of, it doesn't have vampires in and stuff like that. Right. It's got a sort of a religious angle, but it's not Christian. It's got mystery, but it's not yes. like a whodunit. So I totally agree with you. And I, I've tried, I've also been with the sort of horror genre at times. And I keep coming back to thrillers. I feel happiest at the ITW, at Thriller Fest. And yes. I know that is my true home. But it's funny because I've been put on panels at Thriller Fest and I'll be sitting next to someone who writes about the fairies. Yep, and I'm like, yep. this is the wrong panel for me. <laughs> That's just <laughs> know, what you're talking it, about, right? Yeah, of course, it's exactly right. Like, of course, these are all thrillers. And on a side note, I mean, I don't know that anybody has ever defined thriller the same way as anyone else. That's such a broad descriptor, right? It's just such a vague, almost, definition. And I think it comes down to pacing, tone, more than it does actual content. Or one way to put it may be like the difference between mystery and thriller is that in a thriller, we know who the bad guy is up front, whereas a mystery, we're sort of trying to figure it out. And But even then, there's too many books that don't fit that perfect description so that I can't just use that as a broad brush to, to say this is what thriller is. So you're exactly right. Like those fey novels can certainly be thrillers, but they're probably also fantasy, which isn't something that you and I are writing. There's this broad category called thriller that we're probably mostly in, but there's just this lack of, I can't really drill down into, I want to find JF Penn's books. I want to find my books. I want to find Dave Wood. I want to find all of us in one category on Amazon that just doesn't exist yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully other people will join us. If people listening are thinking, oh, well, that sounds like a terrible genre to write in because there's no way that you fit. No, it's a brilliant genre to write in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it is. Because the other side of the coin is we can advertise in all of those genres we've talked about. Somebody who loves historical fiction will most likely like our books as well. It's not going to be set in a, somewhere in a previous time necessarily, but I think there's enough elements of history that people will enjoy mine or enough elements of, like you said, supernatural that they'll enjoy yours. Mm, no, definitely. Well, let's move into the publishing side because you mentioned there that you nailed down your brand, which many authors, my ears pricked up. I'm like, what? That sounds like <laughs> the Holy Grail. I did go to your first book and it did say published in 2014, but maybe that was a re-release. But you have several series, you have several co-writers. So I wondered, what does your indie publishing model look like now and how has it changed over time? So I will say this, I have a 100 year plan. That sounds like crazy and insane and it's impossible to actually nail that down, which is all true. But basically that's what the legacy is that I want to leave. And so I guess, let me back up a little bit. My brand has shifted a little bit over the years as I've learned more about um, who I am as a writer and what I want to do. But all of that comes down to where I want to be 
in 10 or 15 years, or like I said, 100 years. But I always thought of my brand, like who Nick Thacker is as an author, is someone who is an entertainer first. I want to put books in front of people that are fun to read and hopefully can get people to think a little bit. If there's history or there's puzzles to solve, that kind of stuff, it's engaging. So when I say that is my brand, then all of a sudden it's very broad. I can do just about anything and kind of all say, oh, this fits my brand. And you mentioned, you know, hey, it's really cool that I nailed down my brand. Yeah, that's great, but that doesn't mean it's working super well. There's always room to improve, right? I guess I'm interested in many people like both of us start out with one novel and then maybe we decided we're going to write in a series. So we write some more in a series. But when I had a look at your website, which is actually great, it's pared down compared to someone like me. I just have way too much stuff on my website. But your model now seems to be co-writing. So what are you doing? Are you now managing other writers? Are you going to publish other people? Because a lot of successful indies are moving that way. Or are you still focusing primarily on your own books? I do a lot of co-writing. I also still focus on my own solo books. And the reason for that was essentially I I reached a ceiling very quickly of how many books I could write and write them well per year. And I wanted to do more. And I just simply couldn't if I wanted to maintain the quality. I'm just not a fast writer. So co-writing was sort of the answer to that. I could work with people that I enjoyed working with. We could put our heads together on something that we both wanted to see happen. We both wanted to see come into the world. And at the time I was starting to do all this. I had a slightly larger platform than they did. And so it was a good marriage because if they would help me write faster, I would help them with the marketing. And we tried to split the workload as much as possible 50-50. So things were fair and all that. It's worked really well. Working with all the people has been great. Not all of the books have been instant bestsellers, of course. But as we go, just like everything else in indie publishing, it's iterative. We're just trying to figure out what we want to do different next time to make things better. Do we want a rapid release or do we want to release them as we write them? That kind of thing. But it's been working really well generally so far because it's allowed me to broaden my brand to now I'm able to entertain more because I have more products out, essentially. And I have done that several times, but I've not found it take so well. And you've kind of started these other series with co-writers. So it's just something I'm really interested in. But I wanted to ask about pricing because you price your ebooks high. So your ebooks are at $6.99, but you're also in KU. So I wondered if you could explain your pricing model and whether you think it works for wide authors like me. (laughs) Sure. So I'm probably not the best person to ask because I've never really been wide. I mean, I say never really because I've had one or two books that I've tested, but I've never just totally gone wide. So I don't have the experience that someone like you has in being wide and being able to really know what price does. That said, the reason I chose $6.99 was from the beginning... Admittedly, this was just part of my naivety in in the whole thing. I didn't really know what I was doing. I think most of us don't when we get started, and there's nothing wrong with that. I didn't know what I was doing, and so I never really wanted to come across as an indie author. At the time, and there's still a little bit of this, there was that kind of taboo around it more than anyone because you were doing this before I was. And so there was definitely that stigma of, well, this isn't a real book. This is a self-published book, which somehow means it's worth less or valued less. I didn't want that classification on my books. I wanted to be seen as a James Rollins or a Clive Cussler, all the people we've, we've talked about. And those books, those ebooks, were always priced absurdly high, like $14.99 for pieces of uh, digital bits, right? Mm. <laughs> There's literally no reason it should be that high unless you're in the business of printing on dead trees, which traditional publishers are. They don't want to sell books, they want to sell paper, right? And so if you price the book that high, you're basically telling all your readers to go buy the paperback book. Well, the point is all of these books were priced a lot higher than mine. And so I thought, well, hey, if I can seem like a deal compared to those guys, maybe people will buy my books. And like, you know, that's worked, that's worked well since then. But I do have books that are priced a lot higher than most other indie authors. And as the landscape shifts to where more readers are totally fine buying a book published by, it doesn't matter who it's published by, they'll, they'll read anything that looks good. I might start testing lower prices just to see if I can now compete better with indies in my genre since I've got a little bit more of a track record now. Long story short, I test all the time with this stuff. I don't really do much with prices these days, but I have in the past tested $2.99, $4.99, $5.99, just to see if this is selling better, worse, am I making more money? And then I will say, this is sort of just a little tidbit that I've told other authors before. I believe when you're getting started and you're trying to get your name out there, I think it's more valuable to worry about obscurity. You're fighting obscurity rather than making money. Meaning you just need to get your books into people's hands or in front of their faces. So give them away if you need to. Put them for 99 cents. And then once you've developed a good amount of readers, I have 70,000 people on a mailing list. 
And so I know that I can launch a book at just about any price and some people will buy it. And so I can start to make calculations based on it. I know estimates of how much I'll make. When we get started, we don't know that stuff. We don't have that list. And so we're fighting the obscurity. So I'm at a point now in my career where I'm not really worried as much about the obscurity. Yes, of course, I always want to find new readers and get my books in front of more people. But this is my career. At some point, I had to flip between, okay, well, now I got to start making money with this stuff. So pricing the book high, I'm not one gimmick. It's like the psychological trigger for getting people to realize, well, hey, if Kindle Unlimited, I can get the book for free, essentially free. And it's six ninety nine, so I guess I'll just get it in Kindle Unlimited. And of course, we get paid for the page reads and that. So that's worked really well, too. So being in KU, pricing the book for non-KU people, six ninety nine seems to be, I guess, a good equation for me right now. Mm. All that to say, who knows? A 100-year plan, things are going to change. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so funny because, and maybe this is just a sort of UK external or because I've been in this for so long. For me, like no big traditionally published authors are in KU. So to me, the banner of KU separates us from traditionally published authors. Again, that might change. Publishers might start putting big name authors into KU. But it's interesting that you think it's price that separates it which is just yeah. a different angle that I hadn't really considered. And the thing is, people, again, people listening know I'm wide and I'm committed to that and you're in KU. And the point is, everyone gets to choose. So we're, neither of us are saying either way is better. It's just you choose your route. So I think that's important. But I did want to ask you, you've signed a deal with a traditional publisher, Bookature, yes. <laughs> which actually a UK imprint. Yes. So why take the hybrid approach and how are you going to combine the traditional deal with, with indie work? Well, I took that deal because it, it made sense for my career. I mean, it was moving closer to the mountain. And if the mountain for me is entertain more and produce more, this was another way to do that. It was just another avenue to get out there more, right? So this is finding readers and hopefully the sales will go well, but it's about trying something different, trying something new. I never set out to say I'm going to only self-publish. It was very clear once I started making money at this that I could make more money self-publishing than if I were to try to start over and get a traditional deal that maybe gave me $5,000 up front and paid me some pennies on the dollar after that. It just, that wouldn't make sense for me. The Book Couture deal was is structured differently than like a traditional deal with an upfront advance and all this kind of stuff. And so it made sense for me to say, yeah, sure, let's give it three books and see what happens. Worst case, I have three more books out there. And if they're not selling well, at some point, they'll revert back to me and I can self-publish them. And that's great. But even then, I don't think that would be a waste of my time. I think it's just a really fun way to explore new avenues. And that's the key word for me, right? It's fun. I do the co-writing with people I think it's fun to work with. I wouldn't do co-writing with people who I don't have fun working with. Sometimes you don't know up front, right? It could be miserable the whole time. But we build in ways to get out of those deals, right? But with your thing, they're fun. They're great people. It's really enjoyable to work with them. And they seem to really know what they're doing. And so I'm like, hey, this is a great way for me to reach people I might not be able to reach. Are you going to do them within your main series or completely separate? They asked for a completely separate series. That's they want someone yeah. to do. That was sort of the way I was leaning anyway. I've got Harvey Bennett and he's mine, right? I haven't worked with a co-writer on a main Harvey Bennett series novel yet. So that's my solo line. I don't know if it always will be, but we'll see. I'm on book writing book 10 right now. And so I sort of knew that that was going to be, I'm not going to do a Harvey Bennett book with them anyway. But then they came, came back and just asked for, hey, we want somebody brand new. We like Harvey Bennett. That, that was actually how they found me. They read The Enigma Strain and decided, hey, let's ask this guy if he wants to work with us. And so, yeah, they asked for a new, what they, I'm trying to think of the way they pitched it. It was like, they used some Jack Reacher. They were like, hey, we want kind of a Jack Reacher type. <laughs> I'm like, of course you do, right? I, do I have to name him Jack also? Jack Ryan? Or do you have to change your name to Mark Dawson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah, precisely. It was pretty funny. So it's like, okay, I know exactly what they're asking for. They want a Jack Reacher type person to go solve crimes. They want and, vigilante you know, justice, basically, which does have a really good, clear subcategory. And that was the other thing, too, is they sort of took out some of the action adventure aspects, which I'm okay with. Again, is a new sort of a new avenue for me. I've done a little bit of crime. I've done a little bit of just general espionage type thriller. And so this kind of falls more into those categories. But I haven't really explored that a lot. I've always sort of stuck to action adventure with puzzles to solve and things like that. And so mm. anyway, long story short, yeah, it's going to be a fun project. I just turned in the first book and they came back. They had two editors look at it and gave me a lot of really, really great feedback. Well, we'll look forward to seeing how that goes. But I want to circle back to marketing because you also, one of your throwaway comments was, my list is 70,000 people, my email list. <laughs> and I know the whole audience was like, what? How do you do that? So how did you build that list? So the majority of that list was initially built through Facebook ads. 
this was four or five years ago when I started doing that. Like you said, 2014 was when that book was published. So I was right around that time. I came at this whole thing from a marketing background, not from a literary background. And so I knew from day one, mailing list, I need people on a list because if I can own that list, I can email them whenever I want. If Facebook goes down someday or Amazon decides to kick me off, um, I can still have that list that I can market to. And so from day one, I was very, very avid about building people on a list. So when I released my first book, that book, don't tell Amazon because I think it's against their terms of service. I think there's actually ways around it. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I am not a lawyer, so don't do this, anyone listening. I released my first book that's exclusive to Amazon, and that was also the freebie that I gave away to sign up for my mailing list. I only had one book, but I gave it away. Like I said, I was fighting obscurity at the time. And I also ran a bunch of Facebook ads. You can still do it. It still works really well. It's just more expensive now. But I was somewhere in the realm of about a quarter per subscriber, about 25 cents per subscriber. Now I think it's like 25 cents a click. And maybe one out of four or five of those will end up on my list. So it's it's basically quadrupled in price, but it still works, the tactic. Then when I came up with my second book, then I had two books and I gave both of them away as freebies. And then same thing with my third book, The Enigma Strain. Enigma Strain, I can't even say it. Those became my freebies. And to this day, if you go to my website and sign up, you'll see you get three full-length thrillers just for signing up. So I guess that the my strategy was a combination of paying for people to sign up to my mailing list through Facebook ads. And then just giving away the farm, just giving it all away and saying, hey, sign up. You'll get all this stuff for free. I guess at the time, they didn't realize that those were the only books I had. So they got those for free. And then they were on my mailing list. They're not what's what's repeat. next? <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds very simplified and oversimplified. And potentially it is. But truthfully, it was just giving away a lot of stuff and just being very, very open to adding value in any way I could. And just trying to get in front of people. And then the mailing list was always the call to action, no matter what I did early on. I'd rather have you get on my mailing list than buy a book was sort of my mindset because I knew that if I got you on my mailing list, there was a great chance if you stayed there that I could sell you a book later and then again and again and again, right? Mm, absolutely. And I guess we'd say that spending money on building your list can be hard when you're just starting out and you were obviously investing in marketing really early on. And I guess to encourage people, if you have more books, it can be a more profitable thing at the beginning rather than I don't want to encourage people who only have one book to necessarily spend a lot of money on ads. But because as you say, things have really changed, but it still is. I mean, I still grow my list with Facebook ads as well for both fiction and nonfiction. So I, I think they're really useful. I think so too. And like I said, this is sort of tongue in cheek because I didn't know what I was doing back then. I, you're exactly right. Like if you are just getting started, I don't think it's probably wise to spend a bunch of money trying to learn Facebook ads because there's not really a good enough way to measure it because you don't have enough books out. And you're just going to be throwing good money after bad, right? Mm. That said, if you do have kind of a, a knack for marketing and you enjoy that sort of thing and you have some money to, to blow, yeah, sure. You can build a list that way. I'm not saying to go buy a list, right? We're not. Yeah, no, not at all. Saying that. Don't do that. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we're running out of time, but I did also want to ask you in your nonfiction book, Platform Mastery, you say having systems is the fastest way to reach success. So you've talked a bit there about your ad building. You talked about your a formula in inverted commas for writing. But are there any other systems that you have in place, either for writing or marketing, that kind of underpin your success? Oh, that's a great question. I try to build systems around anything that I do more than once. Again, that sounds a little tongue in cheek, but really it comes down to, there was a book, I'm trying to see if I have it here. The guy that wrote the Dilbert comic strip, if you're familiar oh, Scott with Scott Adams. Yeah, Scott, Scott Adams, Adams, yeah. yeah. He wrote a book called How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big. That's a great book. He gave the idea that goals are for losers. What it really comes down to is that you know you can set a goal, and that's great, fine. But if you don't have a system in place to, to achieve that goal, you're basically living in a state of perpetual failure, I think is what he says. And I love that because it's a little hardcore about it. But what it comes down to essentially for me is if I have a goal of writing six books a year, that's great. But there's really nothing underneath that goal that can hold it up. And so he's saying he's arguing to put a system in place to do that. And all that comes down to is, okay, if I can have a system of writing every day, or right now in my life, I've got a you know, five and a three-year-old. So my goal is actually a system to write a certain amount of words a week instead of per day. Because if I had a goal of writing per day and that just doesn't happen, then I feel like I failed. So a system for me would be figure out how to write X amount of words a week or a month or whatever, or figure out how to find three new potential co-writing authors in a month or whatever I think the goal needs to be. I build a system for that goal. Does that make sense? I think so often we're just kind of scattergun with what we do. It's like, oh, this is good. I'll go do that. You know, I'm sure some people listening have gone, oh, quite quick. Do I must do Facebook ads to build my list. 
But I think the answer here is the planning. It's almost like you're taking a step back and actually, like you said, you have this 100-year plan. So does that mean you're evaluating these systems and what your goals are against that plan and saying, no, that's too short term, I'm not going to do that? Yes. So within that plan, obviously, it's not everything is measured against 100 years later, but the big things are. And then what I've basically done is said 100 years just means the future. It's just generally, here's the legacy I want to leave. But then breaking that down, the 10 year plan might include something like, well, hey, I want to actually write a movie or I want to do something with video games. How do I do that? How do I get to that more? What's the system I need to put in place now so that I've got a network where I can start doing that in five years when I want to start on that route, start down that path? And so, yeah, so when I I just measure what I want to do today against a plan that I have for the future, it's really just, it's exactly what you said. It's just a system that I can put in place now and say, well, does this really move me toward that eventual goal? Or can I see a way that this can move me toward that? Or is this really moving me further away? And I need to refocus on either the system I'm building now or the thing I want to do now, or adjust the plan for 10 years from now. I love that. I think that's great. But let's tell people where they can find you and your books and everything you do online. Well, as you mentioned, my website is pretty much fiction only. It's like my indie author mastery. Those are at IndieMastery.com. The main place to find me is at NickThacker.com. You can send me an email there. Sign up for my mailing list. You'll get three free books, remember. And send me an email if you want to connect. And that's just Nick at NickThacker.com. Very easy. I am on Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff, but I tend to use my email and personal online website platform, whatever you want to call it, as my home base. Great. Well, thanks so much for your time, Nick. That was brilliant. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure and hope to do it again soon. So I hope you found the interview with Nick interesting today and that it gave you some ideas around action adventure, book marketing and that longer term view. I also would be very interested in hearing your comments about GPT-3. And please do read the articles I mentioned and tweet me or leave a comment on the show. Or you can even email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on this, whether you're excited or whatever. Anyway, next week is epic episode number 500, where I will be sharing lessons learned from 500 episodes and over 11 years of podcasting with some audio clips from some past episodes, which surprised even me. It's so funny hearing my voice from years ago saying things that I no longer believe. (laughs) So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me 